Okay. Oh, and I didn't get out. I'm so excited about the computer. I don't have to give a lecture, right? I'll just talk about my computer. Okay. Uh, all right. So, um, actually, before I start, are there questions about the second writing assignment? Because that's coming up pretty soon. I, just, I forget what it's next going to be. Next month. Yeah. Are there next Next when? Yeah, it's probably due on Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, are there any questions about it? Pretty similar to the first writing time. All right. Um, okay, so I started to talk about Rousseau. Um, so Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So first of all, his dates. I'm gonna write out Hobbes and Locke again for comparison. Make sure this time, yeah, that is, oh, it's visible, but it's out of focus. Well, since you guys have all of these tech suggestions, is there any way to refocus the camera rather than, other than unplugging it and plugging it back in? <laughs> Uh, do I have a camera driver? <laughs> Did you have an application? No. All right. Um, anyway, that doesn't sound easier than unplugging it and plugging it back in. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so sorry, back to this. Um, so Hobbes' date from number 1588 to 1679, that Leviathan was published in 1651, towards the end of the Civil War. And Locke's dates are 1632 to 1704 in the second treatise. Was published in 1689, right after the Glorious Revolution. So Rousseau were going quite a bit later now. He, he wasn't born until 1712. He died in 1778. And the first thing we're reading by him, the Discourse on, in a, on Inequality. That is the Discourse on the Sources of Inequality Among Men <laughs> was published in 1754. So um, there is quite a step in between. Um, moreover, uh, we're also changing places, right? So both of these people are English. Rousseau, so Rousseau's life was just, um, wild it's like impossible to summarize his life he was born in geneva he practically never lived in geneva um, he traveled all over europe uh, at least like switzerland france and italy often by walking <laughs> um, and uh he did all kinds of things before he wrote any philosophy he was he worked in engraving. He was a secretary to an ambassador. He was a botanist assistant. He was a music teacher. <laughs> he, did, he did all these things, most of them not all that well. Uh, but uh, he also, uh, so he was born in Geneva, which of course was Calvinist. Um, but later he converted to Catholicism when he went to Italy. And then later he converted back to Calvinism. <laughs> um, and there's, um, um, there's a lot of other things that could be said about him. In fact, if, I mean, well, first of all, if you're interested in his life, he wrote the, you know, one of the most famous autobiographies ever, The Confessions, which is uh, definitely worth reading or bizarre. But um, but I think uh, one thing uh, I do 
additional thing I want to mention is that he had two main relationships with women in his life. Now, I mean, why do I want to mention this? Because like his views on men versus women are going to be an issue to some extent while we're reading for Rousseau, but even more so when we see Wollstonecraft Craft responding to Rousseau. Um, so he had two main relationships with women. The first one was with uh, Francois Louise de Warrens. I, I don't know how to pronounce that, something like that. She was um, an independent woman with her own like establishment, like her own house and like servants and stuff. She was 13 years older than him. And he called her Maman, <laughs> it's like mommy. <laughs> that was one that lasted for many years. And then the second one was Therese Levasseur, who was a poor seamstress who he never officially married, but they lived together for many years. Um, and they had five children. And all of the children, when they were born, they immediately gave up to a quote unquote foundling hospital. <laughs> that is, they give them up for like, well, adoption is probably uh, like the best thing that could have happened though. Most likely, like, I think the mortality rate in foundling hospitals is probably pretty high. So yeah, um, now, um, uh, so his, uh, and well, I guess I'll say one other thing about that. So in Emil, so Emil, which we're not reading anything by, although I keep considering putting something from, but I, I keep considering putting something in, but I just don't think there's time for it. So Emil is this book he wrote in 1762. It's kind of it's kind of halfway between a novel and a treatise on education. <laughs> like it's a description of how to bring up this fictional boy, Emile, in the best possible way. <laughs> um, uh, and among other things, he argues that in that book that women should nurse their own children and that men should teach their own sons and daughters, I guess, that's maybe not quite so clear, whether the men should be teaching the daughters too. Uh, so, um, uh, and this is like a, a theme throughout Rousseau's life and thought and a theme that he's well aware of, namely that they aren't consistent with each other, right? Like he doesn't, he isn't doing what he says would be the best thing to do. Um, he also argues in Emile that girls' education should be um, very different from boys' education, which, as we'll see, pro provokes Wollstonecraft's disgust. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, and also in Emile, when he gets to the question of how Emile is going to be taught about religion, he introduces this character called the Savoyard Vicar. Uh, who like gives this long discourse on uh, you know what it's rational to believe in religion or something like that. Um, uh, so when Rousseau really got in trouble towards the end of his life, it was mostly because of that, because of the things that Savoyard Vicar says, which people at least took to, to be, uh, you know, to represent Rousseau's own genuine views about religion. Um, so for all those reasons I have thought about that we should read something from it, but there, like I said, there's no time. Um, he also wrote an opera, by the way, which you can, you can most men read too, if you want to. It's, it sounds the same as all like uh, French operas to me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, right, so as, and I guess uh, one more thing about his life, so uh, as I was saying, eventually he got in trouble for things he wrote in Emile, especially also some of the things maybe he wrote in the social contract, which we'll be reading, um, uh, and he was basically had to flee various places, repeatedly. <laughs> Um, at the same time, so like, I guess it's confusing because, it, so at this period in his life, some people were, really were out to get him, 
However, at the same time, he apparently developed paranoid delusions. <laughs> so he started believing that all these people who were trying to help him were also out to get him, including Hume was one of them. So at, like at one point he went to stay with Hume in Scotland, but he became convinced that Hume was plotting with his mother-in-law, that is Therese Levasseur's mother, <laughs> against him or something. And he left. Um, um, so uh, like he was never that stable a character and towards the end of his life he was like certifiable basically all right so um which kind of leads into or is related in some unclear way to the next thing i want to say about him which is that like if you've read it obviously you must have noticed that he's a very different kind of writer and thinker from hobbes or Locke. um even though he clearly is responding to both Hobbes and Locke. Oftentimes he mentions them by name, right? But even when he doesn't, he's clearly thinking about them. Um, he's also responding to some others, especially Montesquieu and uh, you know various other people, but Hobbes and Locke are especially important. Um, but uh, especially in this work, it's the social contract is a little bit less like this, but in this work, there's like there's no careful definitions. There's no like neat little arguments broken up into sections. It's just like an essay, right? It's just like saying stuff. <laughs> um, uh, and it's like because of this, it's harder and maybe impossible to construct a whole consistent system of politics and um, the things that would have to go with that, like epistemology, psychology, right? Um, um, it sometimes seems that different statements in different places, even in different parts of the same work are kind of made in different moods, so to speak. <laughs> Um, uh, although I don't like, I don't think that explains everything, but, um, um, and I guess one more thing about him that makes him different from Hobbes and Locke and hard to, um, interpret is, well, basically what I already mentioned, namely that he is very self-critical and tends to be self-undermining. <laughs> Right, like we know about all the like all the screwed up things he didn't. Well, not about the paranoia at the end, but we know mostly about all the screwed up things that he did or that happened to him in his life because he wrote them all down in his confessions. <laughs> um, so, uh, but uh, like I think more to the point here. Um, so this is on page fifty. Um, so, in, you know, because it's not divided up into neat sections, um, it, this is part one of the discourse, but like if you're using a different edition, I can't specify more accurately than that. But in this edition, it's on page 50. Um, if nature had des has destined us to be healthy, I almost dare to affirm that the state of reflection is a state contrary to nature and that the man who meditates is a depraved animal, <laughs> right? So what he's saying is it's unnatural to like think and reflect. It's unnatural. And how can we tell it's unnatural because it's unhealthy? <laughs> and yet obviously that's what Rousseau is doing all the time. Um, so he's saying that, you know, like we shouldn't expect him to uh, practice what he preaches, right? He's talking about some way of being that's impossible for him and perhaps for us too. Um, um, so, uh, so all of that makes it like, you know, not that Hobbes or Locke are so easy to interpret all these, but it makes it even harder. It makes it's, it's a much trickier author to interpret. Um, it's sometimes not even clear what the topic is exactly that he's talking about. 
However, having said all of that, they actually there are actually a lot of powerful arguments and like new surprising ways of looking at things, both. Uh, um, um, so like, it's definitely worth picking through that hazier <laughs> style. Um, uh, you know, and perhaps like the things he has to say couldn't have been written in the style that Locke and Hobbes used. Um, and I guess I'll say one more thing about him, which is that some very systematic thinkers, um, like for example, Kant uh, had a huge respect for Rousseau. Like supposedly the only thing that was on the wall in Kant's study was a portrait of Rousseau. <laughs> Um, uh, and he once said that Rousseau was to the moral world what Newton was to the physical world. <laughs> so, um, so it's you know difficult but important and influential. Um, okay, so that's all I have to say about Rousseau in general. Are there questions about that before I begin talking about the book? All right. Well, so, I mean, I guess uh, one more thing. Obviously, he didn't write in. Uh, 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 <laughs> yeah, I know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, obviously, he didn't write in English. He wrote in French. <laughs> um, uh, and I don't really know French very well or I don't really know French. Let me put it that way. <laughs> well, I mean, like I've never studied French, but the truth is, French is actually not that different from English. <laughs> Especially if you know, like, some Spanish and some Latin, you know, you can kind of figure out what it means. Uh, so, um, but also that also means it's actually I think it's easier to translate into English than most other languages. Like maybe just because of the, you know, there was such constant back and forth between. France and England, that a lot of times the idioms are the same in both languages, the like syntax is similar, right? Like as opposed to English and German, which are from some technical point of view, more closely related languages. A lot of times it's very hard to translate a German sentence into English and get the exact sense of it because there's just like ways you can put the sentence together in German that you just you can't do in English. Um, so, um, Anyway, so uh, like for all those reasons, both because I don't know French and because uh, when I do check the original, I don't usually find a lot of problems. I probably won't be mentioning that often, but you should keep it in mind. And of course, if you have a different text than I do, you may have a different translation. And so it might say something different. <laughs> um, all right, so, and actually I can talk about this right away because the first thing I'm gonna say is about the titles. title. So the title is, Discourse on the Origins and Foundations of Inequality Among Men. And the word for man is, I guess this is pronounced om, <laughs> um, right? Um, so uh, remember I said before that in a lot of lo other languages, there isn't a word that has the kind of dangerous ambiguity that the English word man does. But this is an example of how closely connected French and English are. Because at, like, after all, this comes from the Latin word homo. And the Latin word homo does not mean man as opposed to woman. It's common gender, as they say, right? Like it can, it can take a masculine or feminine adjective depending on who you're talking about. Um, so, but the French word om is, is pretty much exactly like man, as far as I can tell. Um, it has the same ambiguities. And Rousseau deliberately plays with this at the very beginning of the discourse. So he says, um, this is in, I hope you figured out you're supposed to read this part, even though it's technically before part one. Right, like the opening section that starts on page 45. Um, I should probably make that clearer on the syllabus. But anyway, this is the first sentence. It is of man that I have to speak. 
And the question I am examining indicates to me that I am going to be speaking to men, for such questions are not proposed by those who are afraid to honor the truth. So first of all, the question he's talking about, this was like, so there was something that uh, various academies used to do where they would publish questions and like um, invite people to submit essays and answer to those questions and then like give a prize for the best one or whatever. So the question proposed by the Academy of Dijon was, what is the origin of inequality among men? And is it authorized by the natural law? That's the question he's, he's answering. So he says, uh, so he's saying, I'm talking about man, right? Because the question asks about inequality among men. So there it presumably means human being. But then he switches to, and here it doesn't just mean man versus woman, but it means like a real man, <laughs> right? I'm going to be speaking to men, right? Like not, uh, what was the term that uh, Schwarzenegger used once? Girly man or something, <laughs> right? Like, I'm going to be talking to real men, right? Because for such questions are not proposed by those who are afraid to honor the truth. Um, so, like, so, so actually, right away, he puts us on notice that he's aware how ambiguous this really is. Um, but uh, I guess I'll probably come back and say something about that later, but for the time being, so, um, so that's the question. What is the origin of inequality among men or among human beings? And see, it has two parts. What is the origin of inequality? And is it authorized by the laws of nature? So, um, So in a sense, Rousseau answers the second part right away in the second paragraph. Right? He says, well, there's two kinds of inequality. There's like natural inequality. He gives the example of difference of age, health, bodily strength, and qualities of mind or soul. And then he says the other may be called moral or political inequality. So, I mean, here moral means like having based on mores, right? Like based on societal arrangements or something like that. Um, moral or political inequality because it depends on a kind of convention and is established or at least authorized by the consent of men. Um, So uh, it's not authorized by natural inequality, or it's not authorized by nature. It's authorized by the consent of men, is what he says. And then he goes on in the next paragraph to say, um, there's no, so there is no point in asking what the source of natural inequality is. Right, that, so that's to rule out the possibility that that's what the academy is asking about, right? He's saying, but clearly you're not asking about the first kind of inequality. The first kind of, kind of inequality presumably is authorized by the law of nature because the source is nature, right? But he says, but you're not asking about that. Everyone knows what the source of natural inequality is, nature, <laughs> right? So he says, um, there is still less of a point in asking whether there would not be some essential connection between the two inequalities. For that would amount to asking whether those who command are necessarily better than those who obey and whether strength of body or mind, wisdom or virtue are always found in the same individuals in proportion to power or wealth. So that sounds like it's an okay question, right? Like, so are the people who are in positions of power there because they're stronger or smarter or whatever? But Rousseau says, perhaps this is a good question for slaves to discuss within earshot of their masters. 
but it is not suitable for reasonable and free men who seek the truth. <laughs> right? That, so that connects it back to that first thing he said about, I, I assume I'm going to be speaking to men, not slaves, is what it means now, free men, right? <laughs> who, um, so he's just saying, like, come on, everyone knows that's not true. That the people who are in positions of power are not always stronger or smarter or anything, right? And the only reason that someone might say the opposite is because they're speaking within earshot of their masters. Um, of course, uh, you know, there is censorship in France. Uh, so, um, and actually, you know, Rousseau had trouble with like trying to get his books published and having them be condemned by the censor and having to publish them in Holland instead and like various, you know, so like people are speaking within earshot of their master. <laughs> um, so, I, so, I mean, like I, on the one hand, I think he's sincere about this point. Right? He doesn't think this question is worth discussing, whether perhaps the source of moral or political inequality is just natural inequality. But I think he's also, if, you know, if you're a careful reader, he's reminding you that he may not be able to say everything he thinks. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, okay, so anyway, like I said, those, those two paragraphs together, they kind of answer the second part of the question, right? It's like saying that moral and political authority, number one, doesn't have its origin in anything natural, and number two, isn't authorized by nature, but rather by the consent of men. Um, so in some sense, the answer is no, but of course that's consistent with the answer being yes in some other sense. Right, like I mean, I think Hobbes and Locke both, uh, you know, agree with both of those points, but still say that political power is authorized by the laws of nature, because the the because the um, ability of men to consent or human beings. Let me switch from Rousseau's talk to my own talk. The ability of human beings to consent to put someone in a position of inequality with respect to them is itself sanctioned by the laws of nature. Um, so, I mean, so I think we don't get Rousseau's complete answer until the end of the discourse. The complete answer is still gonna be no. <laughs> <laughs> not, to, not to spoil the suspense, but, um, but it takes everything in between to explain why the answer is no, I think. So, but what about the answer to the first part? Like, how, does in, how did inequality originate? So it, to address this, um, Rousseau begins in the same way Locke and Hobbes do by asking, well, okay, what are the natural relationships between human beings? Um, or what are the natural relationships between men? Because this is one of the main points where the ambiguity comes up. Like you see when he's talking about the state of nature, sometimes he says that the individual in the original state of nature needed nothing but food, water, and a female. <laughs> Right. So that's like at that point, obviously, uh, he is not using man to mean human being. Um, but uh, at other points, he clearly is, right? When he says, for example, that man is superior to other animals or has an advantage over other animals because the mother can carry the child along while she nurses, right? Because we walk on two legs. So, uh, I mean, 
I don't think that gives us an advantage over marsupials, but anyway, <laughs> you know, as it may. Um, so, uh, so at that point, obviously, men includes women. So it's so it's it's ambiguous, and he's perhaps using the ambiguity. Um, so uh, so anyway, so he wants to ask, well, like in order to to see where this non-natural inequality came from, we have to first ask what the natural state was. Or in other words, what was the state of nature like? Um, however, there are two really important differences, probably more than two, but anyway, two that I can think of, two really important differences between Rousseau on the state of nature and Hobbes and Locke on the state of nature. So the first one is one I've, I think I've already mentioned, kind of previewed before, which is that Hobbes and Locke, actually I've probably previewed both of these before, but anyway, first one is that Hobbes and Locke basically take it for granted that our civilized life is good. Right, so that people who don't have civilization, that is savages, are to be pitied. Their state is wretched. They don't have commerce, they don't have writing, they don't have et cetera, et cetera, right? That whole, all those things that Hobbes lists. Um, now, I mean, not this, it's not that savages accord and, um, it's not that savages, according to Hobbes or Locke, are necessarily in a state of nature, right? Like Hobbes and Locke agree that uh, many savages and perhaps all existing savages are not in a state of nature. I think, you know, they go back and forth about that. But anyway, many of them are not. That is, many people who don't have civilization nevertheless have political society. Um, but I think the other way, um, it's pretty like Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau all agree that people in the individual original state of nature um, would be savages. That is, they would not be civilized. They wouldn't have all our nice stuff. If something went wrong, please try again. <laughs> if something went wrong, too, yeah. Um, I should probably. Um, so, uh, so if being savage is bad, then that's a reason to leave the state of nature, because as long as you remain in the state of nature, you can't be civilized. Um, according to Hobbes, and according to Hobbes and Locke, again, being savage, being in a savage state is bad. So according to them, to both Hobbes and Locke, there's a good rational motive for leaving the state of nature, right? So if we wanna ask, how did we get from this state of nature to where we are now? The answer at least could be, well, we thought about it. We realized the state of nature was bad and we made a rational plan to get out of it. Whereas Rousseau is, like, as you can already tell from that quote I just read, he's like at best ambivalent about civilization. <laughs> um, in fact, you know, there was, there's two discourses. Um, the first discourse is discourse on the science and the arts, which was in response to a different question proposed by the academy. Whether the restoration of the sciences and the arts contributed to the purification of mores. Um, I think uh, by the restoration of science and arts, I, I assume they mean like the Renaissance. But, uh, but like Rousseau takes the question more broadly and asks whether science and arts in general are good for morality or not. <laughs> and, and basically the answer is no. <laughs> so, um, um, so that's one important, so, so, so therefore, if that's true, that the state of nature is perhaps better than a civilized state, um, um, and 
Rousseau definitely sometimes seems to think that, or at least, and this he definitely argues in this book, it's not really very bad. It's pretty good. It might have some disadvantages over a civilized state, but it also has many advantages, right? So that means that, the, you know, that answer I just gave on behalf of Locke and Hobbes, how did we get out of this, isn't going to work for him. We didn't, like, sit down, realize we were in a bad situation and make a careful, rational plan to get out of it because we weren't in a bad situation. <laughs> So if something like that happened, we must have been deluded. <laughs> but I mean, we'll see what he actually thinks happened is much more complicated. Um, or what he actually tells a story about happening. I'll get to that in a second. All right, so anyway, that's one difference. Um, the other difference is that mostly, seemingly, he takes the state of nature to mean what I keep, keep calling the individual or original state of nature. And well, I mean, origin, not just individual, but original, right? I mean, I guess there's really three different things. So, you know, so there's like the state of nature in complete abstraction, which just means like two persons are in a state of nature with respect to each other. There's no judge on earth for them to appeal to to settle their disputes. So those two persons could be commonwealths, they could be people who meet each other on the high sea or, you know, in the wilderness, or uh, I mean, um, they could be families probably. It's, you know, it's just whatever meets that definition is the state of nature. I don't know, I, could, I guess I could call that like the abstract state of nature. And then there's the individual state of nature where like where we, where we add or we, instead of persons, we say individuals, like a group of individual human beings who have no judge on earth to, to appeal to, to resolve their disputes. So, right, and one of the things I kept pointing out was that um, even in Hobbes, there's a, who, who mostly talks about the state of nature in this sense, there's still places where he smuggles in things that really only apply to this, right? Like, well, I mean, the main thing, right? That even the weakest has, the po has sufficient power to kill the strongest. That is arguably true of individuals, but it's not, true of, let's say, if I'm an individual and I'm in a state of nature with respect to a giant commonwealth, right? But then there's like, you know, original state of nature, meaning like before there ever was a civil state. Um, and perhaps before, we'll see in Rousseau, it's before a lot of developments actually. And, but that was, you know, so um, like a lot of things happen. So, you know, this could be like the starting points. Like how, how human beings would be if they had never invented anything, <laughs> something like that. Um, so like Locke already a lot of times brings in assumptions that are proper only to this. Right, that like the population was low, and that you know, so there was plenty of land and stuff like that. But Rousseau is pretty much always talking about this. Well, I mean, he's talking about this. So, like I said, this you know, I think this is true for for Locke too. There's like an original state of nature. And then there's like a pre-civil society development, like a pre-political development, right? So like, according to Locke, one of the things that happens in here is that money is invented, or at least could happen in here, right? So after money is invented, we're still in the state of nature, but it's different now. So, so sometimes you could call all of this the state of nature because it's before political society. 
And sometimes you might call only this the state of nature, because that's the natural way before human beings invented anything, as I put it. So in, in Rousseau, there's definitely the same ambiguity, sometimes by the state of nature. And this is what he's talking about through all of part one of the discourse, so all the reading for today. He's talking about before any development. But then at the, be in the beginning of part two, he's going to start describing all this stuff that happened. And sometimes he's going to call this the state of nature too. Yeah, is there a question? Like uh, in the original state, is that like even precedes language? Okay. Yeah. Well, that is according to Rousseau, it precedes language. Well, so um, um, so. Uh, Right, so so for Rousseau, the state of nature nor like doesn't refer to like an abstract thing that you know state that could happen anywhere at any time. It refers to a historical period. I mean, it's a hypothetical historical period, but um, if it existed at all, it was a historical period. Um, So, um, so this lands Rousseau with a harder version of a question that Hobbes and Locke both discuss, namely, was there ever really a state of nature? Um, right, because Hobbes and Locke can both can and do answer that by saying, well, uh, yeah, commonwealths to this day are in a state of nature, right? And uh, they also, I, well, at least Locke mentions like people on a desert island or, you know, like a Dutchman and a, a American who meet in their forests or you know, whatever, right? So like, these are all people who are not like, I mean, presumably that, the people who are on a desert island together were members of political society. They know all about language and commerce and writing and whatever, but they're just outside of the jurisdiction of any judge on earth. So they're back in the state of nature. So, um, but like none of those answers won't work for Rousseau. Um, so, and moreover, his history, as we'll see, this turns out that would take a really long time. <laughs> so, like, his history implies that if there ever really was a state of nature, it must have been a very, very long time ago. Um, so, it's not like something that there's records of. Or whatever. <laughs> um, and it's not something that we can find people today. I mean, sometimes he mentions the people in the Caribbean as being like the closest to this, but he also makes it clear that they're, you know, that's relative. They may be closer to it compared to us, but they're very, they're already very, very different from this original state. Um, so, uh, so, like, if you take this history seriously, there's a, there's a serious question about, you know, are you sure there ever was a time like this? Um, now, are we take, supposed to take the history seriously? Well, um, so it turns out, uh, oops, uh, we can't take it seriously because, this is on page 46, Religion commands us to believe that since God himself drew men out of the state of nature, they are unequal because he wanted them to be so. So, right, in other words, this history contradicts the Bible. According to the Bible, there wasn't a long, long time, you know, when human beings didn't have language and didn't have, uh, you know, according to the Bible, Adam and Eve were like, 
taught how to name things and then you know uh, and uh like when cain killed abel god said hey you're not supposed to do that and, and, so, and even before that they were cain and abel were engaging in agriculture and, you know so uh okay it's pretty hard to believe and especially if you read what the savoyard picard says it's pretty hard to believe that Rousseau is sincere when he says that. Um, uh, I mean, I think this is one place where you have to remember that he's speaking in earshot of his master. Um, but uh, so then he says, so, okay, yeah, according, you know, we're not allowed to take this seriously according to religion, but I'm just gonna, like, there's no reason I can't pretend and ask what would have happened if, yeah. Um, so is the whole religion component about this that, like, the history of, like, when it might have occurred doesn't matter? Is that what he's saying? I don't understand that. Well, no, I, wait, I'm not wait, sure I understand your question. Because he said that, like, God drew man out of the state of nature. Is, is, is he saying that because like he's trying to say that the, like the time of when the original state of nature occurred and political society occurred, like the time between those two things doesn't matter? Or... Well, no, it's, you know, like, so this story is about how human beings from this original state that he's going to describe by their own nature right like doing things that they understand and you know responding to their experiences and whatever gradually gradually and he says it takes an immense amount of time arrive at political society so like if the story on the bible was literally true um human beings never did that so this is a, like a history about something that never happened that's that's what he's saying, but then but so it's not that it doesn't matter, right? Like if it happened this way, it must have taken a long time. If it didn't take a long time, then there must be some supernatural explanation, right? Um, I mean, he repeats that again when he talks about the origin of language. He says that like it almost seems to be a miracle that they ever came upon language, but then he adds. Um, eventually like he says i'm just gonna skip over like uh therefore i'm just gonna assume that we've somehow got over that difficulty and he says this is on page 68 this will excuse me from expanding my reflections on the way in which the lapse of time compensates for the slight probability of that of events on the surprising power that quite negligible causes may have when they act without interruption um that is it seems like what he's saying in that passage i just read is that it almost seems like it would require a miracle for for language to originate but um but really if i had time for it i could explain to you how given enough time it would happen right like immense amounts of time compensate for the improbability of events and so forth. Um, so, uh, um, so, so again, there, I think he's, he's saying, like, if it didn't take a long time, it would have to be supernatural. So anyway, so officially, he's just like pretending that, uh, that the story in the Bible wasn't true and asking what would have happened. Um, but, uh, he goes on to say that he should be, therefore should be seen as speaking to all human beings. And in particular, he imagines an audience of ancient pagan philosophers, <laughs> right? So, so what he's saying is basically like what I'm saying should be convincing to someone who doesn't know anything about the biblical story. 
And then this is what he says to them. This is how he starts. Oh man, whatever country you may be from, whatever your opinions may be, listen, here is your history as I have thought to read it, not in the books of your fellow men who are liars, but in nature, which never lies. Right? So when he says that, it sounds like he is being sincere. <laughs> Um, in other words, like officially, he's saying this is just pretend that we know, really know the Bible is true. But then he goes to the pagan philosophers and says, don't believe what you read in books. <laughs> believe what you read in the book of nature. <laughs> right? So, um, uh, it's kind of a thin pretense, really, I think. It's not even very... I mean, this raises a further question about it, right? Like, is this really supposed to fool someone about Rousseau? Um, is it just supposed to provide cover for a censor to let the book be published? I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, they did do, do weird things because of censorship. Like I know there was there was like a thing about how the Talmud is a terrible book. And so when they printed books, including the Talmud itself, they changed every instance of the word Talmud into something else. <laughs> so like some like is that supposed that is that supposed to fool the censor? Like in the manuscript it says Talmud, and but in the printed versions it always says something else. Um, I don't know. So maybe I don't understand how censorship works exactly. <laughs> In any case, to go on with Rousseau. So, um, so it sounds like in some sense, he's serious about this history. However, I think it is true. I think he is sincere when he says, of course, I can't be sure about the details, right? That it necessarily happened in exactly this order. I'm trying to explain how it could have happened. And I guess, you know, the question is going to be like, um, so in other words, I think he's sincere when he gives, even though the, the problem about like being inconsistent with the Bible, I think is not serious. The answer he gives in the next paragraph is serious. Let us therefore begin by putting aside all the facts, for they have no bearing on the question. The investigations that may be undertaken concerning this subject should not be taken for historical truths, but only for hypothetical and conditional reasonings. Better suited to shedding light on the nature of things than in pointing out their true origin. Right? So he's he's saying that even though like this is seriously meant as a possible history. Uh, he's not really interested in it because he wants to reconstruct history. He's interested in it because of something it's going to show about the nature of things. That is about the nature of human beings and the nature of society. Like, for example, should we say to ourselves, um, uh, boy, we're really lucky to live in a peaceful political society and we should do anything we can to keep that from going back to the state of nature the way Hobbes does. So, uh, um, or should we say the way Aristotle does, you know, to live in a polis is natural to human beings. Human beings are by nature political animals. Um, so like the point of telling this story is to show how those things can be very wrong. And yet you could still see why there's political society anyway. Um, so in other words, this, this fiction, like it is after all a kind of abstraction. Like what we're asking is not what really happened millions of years ago, but like, um, uh, what belongs naturally to human beings, 
what would they be like if we just left them the nature of rational animals and took everything else away? What would happen? That's, that's what he's interested in. Um, so, uh, so this, you know, given that second difference, so the, the first difference is like a straight on difference between Rousseau and his predecessors, right? They say the state of nature was bad and he says, no, it was okay. But the second one is like a difference in the topic they're talking about, right? So like, they're not talking about the same thing when they say the state of nature. Um, and uh, a, a lot of Rousseau's criticisms of the predecessors are like, kind of uh, unfair in a sense, because they're based on that change of topic. Um, um, however, that doesn't, so they're kind of unfair, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad criticisms, because I think, you know, um, Rousseau criticizes, is at the bottom is criticizing them for talking about the wrong thing. You know, they, this is what th this is what they should have been interested in. Um, we won't get to the bottom of this question unless we we think about what this real original state was like. Um, right. Whereas he says, you know, they keep thinking when they think of the state of nature, they keep thinking about civilized people plopped into a state of nature and how they would act. Um, but, um, but what we need to know is like, how did there come to be such people as civilized people who would act that way? How does that emerge from the nature of human beings simply as rational animals? So, um, Although perhaps he doesn't think rational is the real, I mean, I know he doesn't think rational is the real essential thing. He thinks freedom of choice is the real essential thing. I guess you could call it practical reason, but he doesn't. <laughs> anyway, um, like human beings reduced to the one thing that makes them different from other animals, for instance. Um, So, so how did the criticism go? Well, first of all, he thinks his predecessors have gone wrong in betraying the state of nature because they don't realize how solitary it would be. I mean, Hobbes, of course, says it's solitary, brutish, nasty, and short, right? But by solitary, Hobbes doesn't mean, um, well, so first of all, it doesn't seem like Hobbes uh, imagines people living like literally physically far away from each other and never seeing each other, right? Because if that were true, where does this, you know, like constant fear of violent death come from? No one even knows where you are. and You don't know where they are. <laughs> That's what Rousseau says the state of nature, or the original state of nature would be like. So there's that physical solitude, but um, perhaps more importantly, they have no language. Um, right, so Aristotle in the politics, you know, the, the proof that man is a political animal is pretty short. It's like, it's because man is a rational animal. And rational means, because the Greek word logos means reason, but it also means language, right? So, so, so man is an animal logon ephon, which possesses logos. And based on that, Aristotle proves that it's like natural for us to live together. So in a sense, like, uh, Rousseau is reversing that and saying, 
Um, it's not natural to us to have language. Language is something that someone had to invent. <laughs> um, it's, uh, and therefore, it's not natural for us to live together. So this is page um, 56. It says, um, well, actually, this isn't where it really mentions language. I'm not sure why it isn't really the right quote, but it does, re it does refer to the physical solitude. Um, I mean, well, okay, I'll read this and then I'll say, and to what extent could men mutually perfect and enlighten one another when with neither a fixed dwelling nor any need for one another, they would hardly encounter one another twice in their lives without knowing or talking to one another, without knowing or talking to one another. I think that's why I'm putting that. They don't know, they don't recognize each other. They don't talk to each other. They, they um, don't see each other very often. And when they do, it's not usually the same person. <laughs> um, so like all these things, like uh, worrying that uh, um, someone else is insulting me. Ray, remember how Hobbes says, said that that was really the most in, unlimited cause of war in the law, in the state of nature, that, uh, right, that, that the third cause of war was glory. The, the first one was competition. Even that is, right, in this state is hard to see where it comes from. Like they're not basically competing with each other. They barely know each other are there. <laughs> But the glory one, like you can see where Rousseau is, would say, um, you know, Hobbes, you're imagining like your 17th century English contemporaries <laughs> and just sticking them in the state of nature. And they're, they're like, you know, you know, like you have given me a offense, sir. <laughs> I must challenge you to a duel. You know, and like, uh, meanwhile, they, these the real people in the state of nature don't don't even have language, let alone worry about being insulted. <laughs> um, they don't they don't even realize that other people think about them. Basically, <laughs> so um, now. I mean, this is one place where the question of how to understand this history comes to the fore because um, like I already said that Locke's sociobiology was not very good, but like this this biology is just totally wrong, right? Right, I mean, it's not true that animals that don't have language are not social and don't live together and don't have power hierarchies and don't defend territory and don't compete, right, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, he deals with that a little bit when he talks about sexual conflict and he says, oh yeah, well, you know, chickens and um, deer or whatever are different from us and that's why they do this. But, you know, but that, like, um, I mean, uh, social mammals, like, it's all based on the fact that they do recognize each other. <laughs> um, you know, like with insects, it works differently, right? You know, but like with, you know, um, prairie dogs or horses or lions or whatever, they, they know who the other people, other animals in the group are, and they have long-term interactions with them, right? So, so this is just, so as like a projected real history of, uh, or like real stage of human history, this is not convincing at all. You know, like long before human beings had language, presumably we were like great apes and they lived 
about them. Um, they're not solitary. So, um, so again, like in order to take this somewhat serious, or like in order not to dismiss it as just wrong, I think you have to think of it again less as a serious attempt at like paleontology and more as like again a question about like what belongs to the nature of uh, um, like free animal as such and what has to be added some other way. I mean whether that's sufficient I don't know like it, it may still be that that that's so wrong that it like that it makes the rest of it not usable. I don't know, but that 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 would have to be the answer anyway. Um, so I mean, and in this in this development, he sketches afterwards. There's going to be similar points where he dis, where he discusses the order in which certain things must have happened, and again, he's wrong. Right, like you know, he's like the iron had to be invented before there could be agriculture or something like that. You know, like that's not true at all. Like in the new world, they they never had iron tools, <laughs> so, but they had plenty of agriculture. <laughs> so, um, anyway, um, um, that's all I can say about that for now. So, but so, like, so according to Rousseau, anyway, human beings in the original state of nature were completely solitary. That's one thing that his predecessors don't recognize. And another thing they don't recognize is how well suited human beings are to that solitary state. Like, how, as he puts it, how advantageously organized we are. And so, which would make life in this state really easy, he says. Right? The quote on, about this on page 47. Um, I see him satisfying his hunger under an oak tree, quenching his thirst at the first screen, finding his bed at the foot of the same tree that supplied his meal. And thus, all his needs are satisfied. This place, he doesn't mention the female. But uh, um, later on, when he mentions that, it doesn't make that much difference because he says that, like, what Locke says about the um, about the animals that eat grass, Rousseau says would have been true about of human beings in this state, namely that, and I think he thinks they don't even know that sex leads to pregnancy. He doesn't say that straight out, but I think that's what he thinks, right? So, like, they just think, oh, this is a fun thing to do, and then they, like, wander away. <laughs> and later on, a child is born. <laughs> and, um, and the child stays with the mother until it's able to fend for itself, and then it wanders off into the forest, and then never sees her again. <laughs> Because he says, how could they find each other again? Now, I, I mean, again, again, this is wrong, right? Like, you know, like, of course, animals know where they are. And they like, are able to find their way back. Right? It's not, <laughs> but, um, but it's, it's like, but that's an additional achievement that we're not allowed to assume when we think about this original state of nature. Like the ability to uh, like know that one place is different than other places and, and find your way back to it. So these people just, you know, like that's also why he says that there can't be any domination of one person over another in the state of nature. Because he says that, like, first, I mean, first of all, he says there'd be no point to it. Like, because again, it's so easy to satisfy all your wants. What would be the point of trying to dominate someone else? Like, what more could you get out of it than you already have? And if you say, well, you know, 
oh, but without dominating lots of people, you can't have bread and books and commerce and whatever. But these people aren't thinking, I wish we had bread and books and commerce. They never heard of that. <laughs> So all they know is they're not hungry now because they ate the acorns. As I think I mentioned before, I think acorns really, you can't really eat acorns raw. It's not good for you. You have to like, they have to be processed. The people who, the indigenous people who used to live here ate acorns, but they didn't just pluck them off the tree and eat them. <laughs> so I don't know. Anyway, but yeah, so all you know is you ate these acorns and now you're not hungry anymore. And why would you like want to go dominate someone else? But he says like, okay, so suppose that someone is just like, uh, you know, is so ill-natured and stupid that they decide they want to dominate someone else. He says like, as soon as they turn their head, the person they're trying to dominate disappears into the forest. They never see them again. <laughs> right? Why would they stay there? So, um, 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 so, so basically, like when you think about it this way, you realize that uh, there was nothing really bad about the state of nature. The people weren't hungry, they weren't thirsty. Um, um, they uh, weren't aware that there was anything else they could have that they didn't have. <laughs> um, they weren't afraid of each other. And he goes into some detail about, well, what about the fact that they got old and got sick and, you know, that animals could eat them? And he says, yeah, well, you know, I mean, those things have, first of all, he says about getting sick, he says mostly it's because of the way we live that we get sick. I, you know, uh, there's, there's probably some truth to that, but on the other hand, not that, well, you have to remember that 18th century medicine was rather different from our medicine, like it didn't really work. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, they knew how to do some things like set bones or whatever, but, <laughs> so, you know, because he says, I've never heard it said that, you know, that people who have medicine live any longer than people who don't. Um, so, uh, but yeah, basically he says, yeah, like all animals get sick and get old and they prey on each other and the species, you know, persists perfectly well. So, you know, there's nothing desperate about this situation that would make you try to get out of it. And another thing that his predecessors don't realize, he says, is I mean, I've kind of touched on this already, but it, but it, I, I think it goes even deeper than than what I said so far. Like how different from civilized human beings these human beings in the state of nature were. Um, like, for example, this is what he says on page sixty four. Um, They had not the slightest notion of mine and thine, nor any true idea of justice. Well, no, actually, no, that's, that's a separate thing. Here, let me just read this. They regarded the acts of violence that could befall them as an easily redressed evil and not as an offense that must be punished. Right, so like if someone hit them, they said, ow. That hurt. Okay, it doesn't hurt anymore. <laughs> On to the next oak tree, right? <laughs> like the, the, the feeling that we have of like, I can't let you get away with that. How, could, how dare you hit me? Like didn't even occur to them. They were just like, oh, that hurt. <laughs> so um, he says, well, perhaps there was a kind of knee-jerk response, like immediate response, like the way the dog bites a stone that is thrown at it. Is that true? 
it's all like bite system. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> right? But like, so it was, maybe it wasn't just ow. Maybe it was like ow. Boom. But then they both kind of forgot about it. Because right? <laughs> it doesn't hurt anymore. So, you know, why think about it? Um, um, and uh, um, and in general, they didn't have many of the passions that we that we do. So there's kind of like a general uh, explanation for this. And this is page fifty four. He says. Um, Whatever the moralists may say about it, human understanding owes much to the passions, which by common consensus also owe a great deal to it. It is by their activity that our reason is perfected. We seek to know only because we desire to find enjoyment. And it is impossible to conceive why someone who had neither desires nor fears would go to the bother of reasoning. The passions in turn take their origin from our needs and their progress from our knowledge. For one can desire or fear things only by virtue of the ideas one can have of them or from the simple impulse of nature. And savage man deprived of every sort of enlightenment feels only the passions of this latter sort. His desires do not go beyond his physical needs, right? So the point is that these people like, um, reasoning knowledge and passion all go together and they're like hard to get started separately but also hard to get started all at once together so right that like if you know so like if you don't know that a certain thing is possible then you're not going to fear it or desire it and if you don't fear it or desire it you're not gonna, you have no impulse to gain more knowledge to deal with your fear or desire. And since you don't gain more knowledge, you don't build new fears or desires. <laughs> and so um, you're pretty much like, you have much less curiosity or passion than you do, is the idea. So that thing about someone like, um, um, hitting you is just an example of that. Like, why do, why do we not just react to the actual pain? Well, like, you know, like the first thing I said is I can't let you get away with that, right? Like we're already thinking ahead to the consequences. What if everyone did that? <laughs> Right? Or if you got away with this once, what's to stop you from doing it again? Right? So like we start imagining these possible future scenarios. And because of that, we, you know, we get more afraid than we otherwise would be. And because of that, we start thinking, oh, what can we do to not just in this individual case, but like, what can I do to protect myself against this type of bad thing that can happen? Right, and that's those are the thoughts that Hobbes and Locke both imagine people having, like naturally. Right, like they it's a starting point. Hobbes and Locke both imagine people starting thinking, okay, wait, if there's no one, nothing to stop someone else from hitting me, then this could happen and this could happen. So I have to figure out what I can do to prevent that. Right, and that leads them to get more knowledge, and then their fear gets more specific, and they figure out like what to do. Reason suggests convenient terms of peace, right, as Hobbes puts it. But Locke, but Rousseau is saying this process wouldn't get started because uh, they've never seen these bad consequences. They have no strong incentive to think about them. And because they don't think about them, they don't fear them. And because they don't fear them, they still have no incentive to think about them. And it just stays that way. Um, um, 
right? Or as he puts it farther down on the page, um, he is so far from the degree of knowledge necessary to make him desire to acquire greater knowledge that he can have neither foresight nor curiosity. Like the fact that there's, he doesn't, or she doesn't know everything, or they <laughs> doesn't, the fact that this person doesn't know everything doesn't bother them. Because they don't know enough to realize that that's a problem. <laughs> Again, they're not imagining all the bad things that could happen because they don't know everything. So they have no incentive to learn more things. Um, and, um, and, uh, so that's the thing about no curiosity and also they don't like imagine, uh, like long trains of consequences of what they do. That's the thing about no foresight. So, um, So these people are very different from us. Um, they're very far from being able to become like us and they have no incentive whatsoever to try. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, this is where the, um, this is where the thing about very long periods of time is going to come in. This state is pretty stable. The people who are in it are happy. They're um, healthier than we are, probably. <laughs> um, they don't notice that there's anything that could be improved about it. Um, and they're not really thinking about anything. <laughs> So it's going to take a long, long time for anything to change. Um, there's one other criticism that I'm, I think I'm wishing, you know, I kept my notes down because I thought they were too long. But. You know, I'm realizing I probably would have had time to say a little bit more, but that's okay. You won't complain if I, <laughs> I finish early. <laughs> so, uh, um, but there is one more thing I wanted to talk about, which is, I mean, this is also a criticism of um, Hobbes and Locke too. Well. Um, so it's about, it's about pity. So, I mean, this is, I think this is a little bit weird because this is not, um, well, it raises question about how that abstraction I was talking about gets defined. I mean, so these people have, Rousseau says that they have, first of all, they have free will, which makes them different from the other animals. And that's their biggest advantage. And he says that, um, and like, it doesn't come, it doesn't involve reasoning exactly, but it does involve like um, imitation. So like he says, other animals have to eat whatever they instinctively eat and they have to fight the way they instinctively fight and so on and so forth. But he says that like, even in this original state of nature, what the humans could do that the other animals couldn't is look at what the other animals are doing and say, oh, I could do that. Um, so, right, like he says, uh, I mean, he seems to assume that every every animal could be nourished by every food and they just don't like, right? Like a pigeon, he says a pigeon will starve within sight of a good flesh meal because 
Um, it's in, it does, instinct doesn't like direct it to eat. Well, the truth is like a pigeon probably couldn't digest meat very well. Or, I don't know, actually. Maybe they do eat that. But maybe he's wrong about pigeons. They pretty much eat whatever you throw away. <laughs> but anyway, there's certainly examples of animals like that, right? And and certainly in the other direction, right? Like, you know, um, if uh, you try to feed your cats uh, a vegetarian diet, they would probably die, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so, but like he doesn't, so, but, so his, his thought is that they could, maybe, I, th this probably does happen to some extent, I don't know, but that they could eat other things, but their instinct doesn't direct them to do it, whereas the humans, and, you know, so in any case, that, so that's what I'm saying that free will is like what's essential to human beings and defines this abstraction. But he does throw in some other stuff. I mean, one thing he throws in is the fact that we stand on two legs. As I mentioned, he said that gives us an advantage over other animals because um, the mother can carry the young while she's nursing them. And I think he at least alludes to another thing that's important about that, which is that we actually can see much farther than most other animals, right? Except for some very big ones. <laughs> it's just because we're, our head is so far up. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, you know, like that's really already bringing in, I mean, he himself mentions that, like, and he has a like note of appendix about this, that maybe he shouldn't assume that we always were bipedal. Maybe he should assume that to begin with, we walked on four legs and tries to prove that we didn't because our spine enters our skull the wrong way. Which is true in the sense that, you know, there's a whole exhibit about this, the Cal Academy, I've never seen with my kids, that if you look at fossil hominid bones, you can tell whether they were bipedal or not by looking to see what direction the spine enters the skull. It's right, if it's excellent, animals that walk on all four, the spine enters the skull in the back. So, uh, but like Rousseau didn't realize, I guess, that those things might have changed together. <laughs> well, but anyway, so like, so that's kind of a random thing to throw in. This isn't really random, this is kind of important. Um, and he uses it to like explain why human beings in a state of nature, to the extent that they had anything to do with each other, wouldn't be like um, selfish and cruel. Um, because he says, you know, it's not, the reason is not because they would uh, they would follow they would figure out the laws of nature right they would figure out some abstract principle like don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you or something like that this is, they're not thinking about things like that but the reason is just that it's natural to us when we see um, another human being or to some extent any animal and the stress that that like we don't like it um, it's uh, unpleasant. So, um, you know, and he gives this example of a person who's like tied up and has to watch, watch a child being torn up by a wild beast and whatever. And he says, like, can you imagine how anguished they would be? Like, they can't do anything to help and they have to watch this. So I guess it's not even his example. It's from, he takes, takes it from Mandeville. That's another person I guess he's engaged with here. But um, so the point is supposed to be that um, it's not the type of things that you need civilization to build up, like reasoning and philosophy and whatever, that's, that is the main source of what we, what looks to us like moral behavior, like being nice. And there's a strong natural source of it that doesn't depend on any of that stuff. And 
So this is his kind of like weird double-edged example to prove this. Um, such is the force of natural pity, which the most depraved mores still have difficulty destroying. Since every day one sees in our theaters someone affected and weeping at the ills of some unfortunate person, and who were here in the tyrant's place would intensify the torments of his enemy still more. <laughs> right? So he's saying, like, should civilized French people go to watch a tragedy in the theater where a tyrant kills the hero and they're like overcome with tears and uh, pity, even though they're, they're, these people are so depraved that if they actually were in the situation of a tyrant, they would be even crueler. <laughs> so the, I mean, um, it's, uh, I think what it's supposed to show is, well, I'm not sure how well it shows it, that like pity without any of these other things would be dependable. Right, or as he says on page 64, um, um, pity is what in the state of nature takes the place of laws, mores, and virtue with the advantage that no one is tempted to disobey its sweet voice. Right, like when you feel pity, you feel like you, and I mean, I think pity, I'm not even sure pity is exactly the right word for this in English, but he's talking about, but when you feel distress because someone else is distressed, you're not like um, fighting against a temptation not to care about them or something like that. On the contrary, like all your tendency is to care about them. So he's saying that pity is actually more reliable in a state of nature. And why don't we realize that? Because we live in the civilized state where there's all these things that interfere with us. And we have to put ourselves in this, this special situation in a theater where we have nothing at stake. And then it comes back, right? But in the state of nature, there would be nothing inter to interfere with it. And so it would be um, much more reliable than our reasoned morals. And I, I mean, I, the, the reason I think, even though I'm, I'm like reading something in here, he doesn't say all of that stuff, but I think that's his point because I think that's the point that tells against Hobbes, right? Because of course, Hobbes doesn't deny that we have this feeling of pity or sympathy for others in distress. Um, and remember, I keep telling the story about Hobbes, right? Where someone asked him, why are you giving alms to the beggar? And he said, because, uh, you know, um, his situation distresses me and I want to relieve my distress. <laughs> so, um, you know, so like, you know, Hobbes and Locke in saying that we do, I do everything for, because of my own pleasure and pain, it doesn't mean that I'm not motivated to help other people because they agree that sometimes seeing someone else in pain makes me in pain too. And the, at least one way to relieve it is to help them, right? So, but I think that, you know, so if Hobbes doesn't deny this, why doesn't it interfere with his depiction of the state of nature where people are pitiless, basically? And I think the reason is because Hobbes thinks it's not sufficiently reliable. That's right, that's what he says about it. Like this is, is not to be reckoned on. The only thing that can be reckoned on is fear of credible retribution. Um, and so Rousseau is saying, no, it's the other way around. All your fear of credible re uh, retribution doesn't make people as good as they would be if they just followed their own natural instincts. Um, okay, so that's all I have to say for now, and I'll see you next week.